Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of request. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, Karen didn't want to solve the problem over the phone, so she had to pay $20,000 for my constant visits. The second story, Mr. Debtor wrecked his vehicle that had a high interest title pawn loan. He refused to cooperate and lied about the loan. The third story, Parents purchased property to sell to neighbors, whom property owner refused to sell to, resulting in a loss of money to the original property owner. The first story is, Don't waste your valuable time troubleshooting over the phone. All right, I'll come on site instead. I'm a Cisco certified network engineer, and I work for a small managed IT solutions company started by a good friend of mine. Most of our clients are small to medium size spread out all across the state. We pride ourselves on our top-notch customer service, and the fact that we haven't lost a single customer in 10 years of doing business. All of them, except one. One of our clients is a small Catholic diocese, and most of our work is done in the small elementary school they have. Everyone there likes us for the most part, except the secretary, who we will refer to as Karen from this point forward. Karen has hated me from day one for whatever reason, but I try my best to ignore her. The problem with this, however, is that for some reason whenever anyone in the school has an IT problem, they call Karen first who then forwards the information into our ticketing system or calls us. To be fair to Karen, they aren't meant to do this, as the person with the problem is meant to make the ticket. But the end result is that Karen is always my first point of contact with this client, and it came to the point that I hated seeing this client to come into our system or phone lines. Now, normally a network engineer wouldn't be contacted for every little IT problem that could easily be handled by a level one help desk technician. But since we're a small company, less than 10 employees, and this client doesn't really have too many issues, I was tasked with dealing with any IT problems they had, as I was the one that originally designed and implemented their network and their other IT needs. What is important about this is that our contract with this client specifically stated that they have unlimited hours over the phone for help desk needs and are allotted an 8 hours of on-site time every month, and anything more than that we will charge them an additional hourly fee. This is very important for later. Now like I said, Karen never liked me, but I always took the high road for the sake of the company and our reputation. As a result, the small things she would do to inconvenience me would go unchecked. That was until she crossed a line. We had a new client that needed to have a network set up that I had spent a good month designing. Separating VLANs, writing ACLs, designing routing protocols, and other networking stuff. And they were a good four hour drive away from our office. Anyway, as I'm preparing to leave, a ticket comes in from Karen. One of the teachers apparently got a virus on their personal computer and had brought it in for whatever reason. This is not covered in our contract, as we own all the computers at the school. They just rent, as it's cheaper than buying them all, and personal computers are not to be used on the school's network for security concerns. I shoot off an email explaining the policy, but given that the problem that was described was more than likely caused by a malicious Chrome extension, they're everywhere. I explained in detail how to find and remove it, and they could call and I could walk them through how to fix it if they needed help. I fired off the email, and think all is well, and continue prepping for my trip. Wrong. I'm on site the next day and get a call from my boss saying that the principal of the school called and left an angry voicemail saying that I had told Karen that I refused to help her and typed it in all caps. Luckily the boss knows me and that I wouldn't do that and as the boss has full access to our ticketing system, he checked my reply which was nothing like Karen described. He wasn't upset because I did nothing wrong but he just wanted to let me know what Karen had tried to do. Now this put me in a bad mood for the rest of the day and as I'm silently fuming while setting up the network, my work phone goes off. And guess who it is? Karen. She's calling in because something wasn't working on her computer and her mood was absolutely foul. I'm assuming her boss chewed her out for lying. I'm trying to help her fix her problem by running some basic diagnostics and after about 30 minutes, she just yells at me saying that I'm wasting her valuable time and not fixing her problem and that I should come on site because she refuses to waste any more time with me. Alright then, you're the customer. Now remember when I said that they only get 8 hours of on-site time a month before we charge them by the hour? Keep in mind that this also includes drive time and their school is an hour away from our office. So two hours of travel plus one hour minimum, even if I'm only in the school for five minutes. Also, remember that Karen is my only point of contact for any problems, big and small, and Karen's valuable time can't be wasted over the phone. So then begins three months of not wasting Karen's extraordinarily valuable time. Laptop not booting to Windows and just needs a 30 second hard reset to wipe the memory. Be right there. Monitor not turning on because the cable came loose? On my way. Printer needs to be unplugged and plugged back into print? Hang tight, you get the picture. 
For the record, my boss was okay with this, as I told him what Karen had said, and he hates her just as much as I do, and if the client requests an on-site visit, we're contractually obligated to go. The only reason that this was even allowed to keep going on for as long as it did was because Karen was best friends with the principal, and she covered for her. At the end of those three months, I estimated Karen racked up close to $20,000 in extra on-site time. On the fourth month, we got a call from the head of finance from the client, asking us to come in for a meeting to explain why their quarterly bill was off by about $20,000. Both me and my boss show up and explain to the head of finance and the priest, top dog at the diocese, why they got charged so much more than usual, and showed them the documentation citing what Karen had said and all the on-site requests. We also showed them for good measure the incident where Karen had outright lied to get me in trouble, to further drive home that this issue was solely a result of Karen. All of this was new information for both of them, and they also explained for our benefit why they were now taking a closer look at the school's expenses. Apparently, the principal had been doing some not-so-sanctioned activity, using the diocese's fund, and had been asked to resign effective immediately, and they were reviewing all the expenses over the last year or so. They thanked us for clearing things up and bringing Karen's behavior to their attention, and we left. I didn't get any calls from that client for a few weeks, and when I went there for their monthly on-site visit, Karen was no longer at her secretary's desk, and someone new was there. I've never smiled wider. The second story is, it's your truck after all. Automobile insurance adjusters navigate a valley filled with mendacity and misrepresentation. For every 10 people I spoke with at least half either omitted something material, lied, or committed fraud. Helpful points. The named insured on a policy is required to follow the insurance policy contract to obtain coverage. Usually the DMV will have the name of the lender on the title. A total lost vehicle is stored around 45 to 60 days before storage charges start. Story. Mr. Detter had a very fancy, new to him, fixer repair daily truck. That truck had every conceivable option and was ultimately an overpowered vehicle for an experienced driver. Surprise! Mr. Detter wrecked that POS, piece of excrement within three months of purchasing it. If you're gonna wreck it, then go all out. This vehicle had a completely smashed front end with all airbags deployed. Rollover damage to all panels, frame damages, broken glass, and of course, most of the engine compartment obliterated. In short, this car is called a total loss. The cost to repair the vehicle is more than 75% of its value, and it is not feasible to repair. Mr. Detter's minor physical injuries were eclipsed by the mortal blow received by his pride. He let me know how I was directly responsible for his drunk driving crash, his injuries, and that I needed to go to hell and live there. This was the first call. Lovely. Fast forward and I've given Mr. Detter an offer to resolve his total loss. I check the DMV. No lender is listed on the title. Total loss call. Me. We're ready to settle this claim for you. Do you have the title? Mr. Detter. Yes. Me. Do you have a loan on the car? Mr. Detter. No, of course not. Insert long and misogynistic rant regarding his wealth, status, and superiority. Me. Thank you for sharing. I can come to meet with you today, sign the title transfer and give you the funds, as you're listed as the owner. Mr. Detter. No, I have to get the title out of the safe deposit boxes at the bank. Over the next 60 days, Mr. Detter hems and haws about this title for over two months. Every week I call him and mail a letter regarding the need to sign and mitigate damages, towing, storage, etc. Which brings us to the phone call that lets the fresh breeze in. The phone call that changes everything. 10 a.m. Monday. Me. Hi, it's been a while and I'm still needing that title from you to settle your claim. Mr. Detter. You're harassing me. Me. No, sir. I'm fulfilling my obligations to you as a customer. I need to get your title to pay your claim back. Mr. Detter. Listen here, you're on my schedule, not the other way around. You think you're insert elevator music of curses, insults, and misogyny. Me. Sir, I'm just trying to save you the hassle of dealing with the truck. Storage is starting soon. Mr. Detter interrupting. I'm going to call you when I'm good and ready. You'll get the title then. If you call me again, I'm filing a police report. It's your car. Deal with it. Phone call ends. Mr. Detter has given me a clear and unmistakable indicator that he's not cooperating and is in violation of his contractual responsibilities. I can't abandon Salvage. I can, however, do this. 11 a.m. Monday. Me. Hi, Salvage Vendor. You have Mr. Detter's truck on the lot. He's not ready to resolve his claim. Can you tow it back to 123 Detter Hell Lane? Yes, that's right. In his driveway, please. And with that, Mr. Detter's wondrous wreck of a vehicle is towed to his property. 1 p.m. Monday. Mr. Detter. What the heck? The HOA called. You can't leave that in my driveway. I'll sue you. My neighbors are asking questions. Insert the rant. Me. Hi, Mr. Detter. I'm sorry for the confusion. You see, the truck is yours after all. You're on the title and have refused to help me process this claim. As you requested, the vehicle will remain on your property until you're ready. Mr. Detter. My HOA is fining me. You must pick up the truck now. 
Me. No, you still haven't provided the title. When you're ready, let me know. Is there anything else I can help you with? Mr. Detter slowly deflating. You can't do this. Me. Sir, the truck is yours. You refuse to complete the paperwork and I have no legal standing to store the vehicle indefinitely. Remember that valley of mendacity I mentioned? Brace. Three, two, one. Mr. Detter. A low growling noise is heard. I'm broke, title pawn. Me. I'm sorry? Mr. Detter. I don't have the title. It's at I'm broke, title pawn. Me. I will not call him a liar. I will not call him a liar. I will not call him a liar. Oh, sorry that I misunderstood that you had the title. Can you give me their number? And with that, the dragon was slayed. I called a subprime high interest title pawn company. They were surprised to learn about the vehicle being wrecked, and the balance remaining? $3,200 in 13 months. Mr. Detter thought we were going to hold his wreck for 13 months. He signed and the lender was paid. Oh, the vehicle. I had the signed paperwork in hand and had the vehicle picked up on a Tuesday morning. The last story is Land Deal Gone Awry, A Tale of Vengeance. My parents live in a nice quiet neighborhood. For the most part, everyone gets along well and the neighborhood exists in its own little bubble. The only time you see people from outside the neighborhood bubble is on Halloween. Our backyard neighbor, a single middle-aged woman who we'll call Sally, was kind of adopted by our family and came to all holiday parties and family get-togethers. We all love her and that made our revenge all the more satisfying. Sally had a next-door neighbor who owned a lot between Sally's house and her own. When the neighbor expressed an interest in selling the lot, Sally offered to purchase it and a deal was made. Unfortunately, Sally's neighbor died prior to the land deal being finalized and the lot went into her assets to be distributed to her only daughter, who we will call Resting Beeface or RBF. RBF disliked Sally and refused to sell the empty lot to her because she believed Sally had been attempting to screw her mother over. RBF claimed she was going to sell it to an interested developer who would build a house there. When my parents heard this, they were upset. Our house was on a hill and the empty lot also ran up to our backyard. My parents did not want to look down into another house slash backyard. Likewise, Sally did not want a house next to her, so she tried one last time to purchase the lot. She offered more than she had originally planned on paying, but RBF said she would never sell the lot to her. My parents and Sally hatched a plan though. My parents, whom RBF did not know, had an attorney draft a purchase offer for the empty lot. They offered several thousands less than Sally's original offer had been. RBF hemmed and hawed, but came back with a counteroffer equivalent to Sally's original offer. My parents offered her 5,000 less and she accepted. After the sale was finalized, my parents sold the lot to Sally for the same price they purchased it. Sally ended up receiving the lot for 5,000 less than she had originally agreed to pay, and over 10,000 less than what she had offered to RBF. RBF did find out what happened and tried to negate the contract with my parents on account of fraud, but that's obviously not a legitimate claim. RBF never spoke to Sally or to my parents after she learned what happened. Another interesting tidbit, after purchasing the lot, my parents notified the town of their intent to not develop the property so nobody can ever build a single family dwelling on it. Killed two birds with one stone, no downhill neighbor, and the property stays in the family. Thank you for watching. Be sure to subscribe if you want more videos, and thank you for your support.